Please stand if you're able for the reading of God's Word. Today our passage is Mark chapter 13, verses 14 through 23. For when you see the abomination of desolation standing where he ought not to be, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down, nor enter his house to take anything out. And let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in in those days. Pray that it may not happen in winter. For in those days there will be such a tribulation as has not been from the beginning of the creation that God created until now and never will be. And if the Lord had not cut short the days, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened the days. And then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or look, there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect. But be on guard. I have told you all things beforehand. May God bless the reading of his word. Please be seated. Thank you, Brian. Well, good morning again. Okay, we can do a little better than that, I think. Good morning. Okay. Thank you. We're moving into good days, aren't we? Well, we're continuing through Mark, as you know, and we are continuing through the Olivet Discourse, and I might just say that the verses we're on today have always fascinated me since I first read them after I became a Christian when I was 28. They've always fascinated me. Um, Points of indecision are extremely difficult. They're difficult for individuals. They're difficult for families. Sometimes they're difficult for cities and regions. They can be very difficult for nations. Points of indecision are extremely difficult. Points of crisis can be confounding. Who knows what to do? Sometimes we can listen to the wrong people. Imagine you're at the crossroads with the enemy approaching. There are two paths. Run or stand and fight? Run or stand and fight? Who do you listen to? In our scripture today, Jesus tells us exactly what to do when the tribulation comes. What a blessing. What an absolute blessing from the Lord to know what to do. Perhaps thousands and millions of lives saved listening to Jesus. Uh, I wish I could listen to Jesus better, and I imagine some of you feel the same way. He has helped me with so many things, including listening to him, and yet I know I could still listen to him better. Would you like to listen to Jesus Christ better? Would you like to hear him and hear from him more? Especially in times of trouble, right? Especially in times of trouble at points of indecision. I think we all would. Here today, Jesus sends us a great message. Will we hear? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Uh, Your word is a a lamp unto our feet. Um, It gives us direction. It is inspired by the Holy Spirit. And with the Holy Spirit indwelling us, there is confluence between the word and our hearts and minds. We follow you with the mind of Christ. Your sheep hear your voice. Lord, help us to follow you. Help us to follow you through times of danger. Help us to follow you the way that you want to be followed. Help us to follow you through tribulation the way that you want to be followed. Lord, um, there's a lot going on these days, Lord. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your providence. We thank you for your mercy. We ask you to teach us today. We thank you for it, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our title today is The End of the Road. The End of the Road. 
It's a modern title and probably won't make sense to people in 300 years. We have four points today. Point one, run to the hills. That's verse 14. Point two, make a speedy getaway. Make a speedy getaway. That's verses 15 and 16. Point three is tribulation. Tribulation, that's verses 17 through 20. And point four is discernment. Discernment, that's verses 21 through 24, I think. I think maybe I got that wrong. I'm not sure. Again, our title, The End of the Road. The End of the Road. Please read with me. Look it down at your Bible, or if you'd rather look up at the screen like I do, look with me there. This is verse 14 and point one, run to the hills. But when you see the abomination of desolation standing where he ought not to be, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. When you face something that is insurmountable, you run. Uh, uh, I remember, I remember once I was, I was in the water in the Pacific snorkeling, and I was being circled by a shark. <laughs> and guess what? My goal was to swim away under the water. By the way, because they key off on flopping on the water, they think you're a a dead fish. But there's nothing a person in the water can really do unless they have a weapon, which I didn't, against a shark. So when you face something insurmountable, you run, you skedaddle. Now, when you face something that is unholy and polluting, you flee. I don't know if you know this. This is a biblical principle, actually. When you face something that is unholy and polluting, you flee. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10.14, flee from idolatry. Flee from idolatry. So you don't go around and stand around in the red light district. If you find yourself there, you take off. You take off. You flee from idolatry. The abomination of desolation referred to in our verses is idolatry. It's idolatry. Everyone agrees, scholars, commentators, everyone, everyone agrees that it is the abomination of desolation is a kind of pagan soiling, a kind of paganism which desecrates the temple. Historically now, this happened. Daniel 9 and 11 predicted an evil personage coming which would pollute the temple and get rid of true sacrifices. It would get so bad, this this infection, this pollution, this idolatry, this soiling in the temple, it would get so bad that people would leave the temple, that they would have to leave the temple. Now this actually had happened approximately 15 and 100 years earlier earlier than our text, according to the book of Maccabees, which Catholics hold as canonical. King Antiochus IV, the Seleucid emperor, forbade sacrifices of the the Levitical kind and implemented instead in their place the sacrifice of swine. He erected statues of himself and set up prostitution in the temple. This was a real-time historical abomination. Later, though, in AD 40, Caligula tried to put his own image in the temple. So this is 40 years later. The other thing was before. Although this stopped, other abominations, like actual murder, occurred in the temple. Finally, under Titus, we've talked about Titus before, 
as we've gone through Mark and these passages as we go through the book of Mark. Finally, under Titus, who destroyed the temple and Jerusalem in AD 70, the prophecy of Daniel could be seen as realized. However, many Christians believe the great tribulation is yet to come, as indicated by the man of lawlessness in 2 Thessalonians. Here we see the actual Antichrist who comes and completely fulfills the prophecies of Daniel. Here we see that the downfall of Jerusalem and the arrival of a God-defying figure shows that the end is drawing near. In all of this, in all of these things, these circumstances, historical or futuristic that I've described, in all of this, it is necessary to flee. It is necessary to run, to flee idolatry, to flee ungodly behavior, to flee impending trouble and doom at the end even of the age. Point two now, making a speedy getaway. Making a speedy getaway. And I think this is, uh, is it verses 14 or is it 15 and 16? Did I make a mistake? If I made a mistake, I'm sorry. This is verses 15 and 16, no? Okay, good. Making a speedy getaway. Make a speedy getaway. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down, nor enter his house to take anything out. And let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. You know, sometimes just in our own time period, we see a disaster coming, you know, a tornado's coming or some kind of a hurricane or a storm or something like this. And some people are making preparations for a long time so they're ready to go, but there can inevitably be somebody who at the last minute <laughs> tries to revisit their residence and get, get out of it the things that they value the most. So this is making a speedy getaway, which Jesus advises us to do. Do not go down nor enter your house to take anything out. Don't, don't turn back. Jesus gives us great advice here. When Christian disciples see this stuff going on, they need to make a speedy getaway. We're used to packing our clothes to go on a trip. You know, they've been talking about on the news, air travel a lot lately. Have you noticed this? No, not really. There's, there's been a lot of, there's been a lot of, uh, a lot of issues, a lot of issues with flights airlines, and staffing, right? But we're used to packing up and getting our clothes to go for the trip, and maybe now sometimes we try to pack fewer suitcases so we don't have to pay so much extra. How many of you plan for a trip, right? Okay, now we're getting somewhere. How many of you pack carefully? Some of you, most of you probably pack more carefully than me. I kind of just start throwing stuff in the bag. Kathleen packs carefully. In times of trouble, when, when, when danger's approaching quickly, it is common to hesitate, though. Right? That's, that's, that's something that, that happens a lot, especially without training. Jesus says, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't hesitate. Don't go back to your house to pack. Don't, don't, don't second-guess things. Just leave. There won't be time for preparations. I remember in high school, I had an inner-city inner city friend uh, who, who I played uh, chess with. Chess was a big part of my life between uh, ages 11 and 12 and, and 17. I used to you know, go around the country and play in tournaments, and I was on these teams, and I'd play, play older men, I'd play adults too, not just other teenagers. But I remember in high school, I had an inner city friend, he came from the inner city, who I played chess with. Uh, he was quite good, uh, not an expert, but quite good, and later he became an army officer. He moved uh, to our town from, if I recall correctly, the south side of Chicago, 
the year before. And this is the way he came to us. One day as a teenager in the south side of Chicago, he was approached by the gangs in the neighborhood, in his neighborhood. And they told him he must join the gang. They weren't giving him a choice. See, this is how it works. They told him, you must join the gang. He must join or that would be it for him. You know, sort of, sort of like the way the Romans used to do it in ancient times. You're either for us or against us, or sort of like the Napoleon used to do it that same way. You're either for us or against us. So this, this pack, this gang comes to him, a 13-year-old teenage boy in the south side of Chicago, and they tell him, you're either joining our gang or we're coming to get you. Well, the young teenager, my friend, went home, later my friend, not my friend at that time, the young teenager went home and he told his single mother this. She did not worry. She did not call the police. She bought a bus ticket that day, quit her job, and got on the bus all in the same day. She didn't even know where she was going, if I remember the story right. She just bought a bus ticket going west. When the bus stopped in our town on the Mississippi River by John Deere, which was three and a half hours away, she looked around, she got off the bus with her son, and they started a new life. This is how I came to know him, how he came to play chess, and how he eventually went to college and became an army officer. His mother, although not with a lot of means, did not hesitate. She took her money and bought a bus ticket going anywhere, as long as it was away from the south side of Chicago where the gangs demanded her son. Jesus tells us to make a speedy getaway when we see the abomination of desolation coming. With all due respect, how many must flee idolatrous churches today where abominations are taking place, where the word of God is not taught, and where communion does not truly take place. You know, there is such a real thing as communion. There's a real communion, right? And there are churches where real communion does not take place. And there are certainly, we see many, many churches where the word of God is not taught. If the word of God is not taught in a church and if communion is not really taking place, what you're going to have, to be honest with you, is what you're going to have is you are going to have idolatry running rampant. Sometimes we must even flee churches where those who are not even Christians are in control of the altar. All Christians must watch, as we learned last week in our sermon last week. Watch, last week was watch, witness, and persevere. With all due respect, realize large parts of the country are becoming highly idolatrous. And recognizing this, perhaps, in certain places, someone may need to flee towards better ground. But most of all, when you see the abomination of desolation, when you see big-time idolatry in churches, you must make a speedy getaway. The end is drawing near. Point three, tribulation. Point three, tribulation. Verses 17 through 20. And alas for women who are, pre who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infant infants in those days. Jesus shows a special concern for those in this situation here. Verse 18, pray that it may not happen in winter, for in those days there will be such great, such tribulation as has not been from the beginning of the creation that God created until now and never will be. And if the Lord had not cut short the days, if the Lord hadn't shortened these days, no human being would be saved. Hmm, right? Now realize, when we talk, this is just a sidebar, 
and I'm not even re- relating it that closely to the verse, but it's worth noting. Realize when we talk about salvation in the Bible, which is the Greek word sozo, it can be translated salvation, it can be translated saved, it can be translated other things too, um, life or getting life if you wanted. But, but salvation has a, both an eschatological character and it can have a physical character. So you're physically saved from death, that's one type of salvation. And then there's also the salvation we talk about as Christians that we're eschatologically saved, that we're spiritually saved, that we're saved for eternity, that we will go to heaven, that we will spend, spend eternity with God in heaven, that we're born again, etc. Okay, so anyway. And if the Lord had not cut short the days, no human being would be saved, but for the sake of the elect, so see, that sort of shows that this is physical. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose, because they're of the elect, but for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened the days. They're, they're saved, right? Hope that made sense. These verses related to the tribulation are some of the most difficult in all of Scripture to interpret. Uh, my father-in-law and mentor, General McGrath, used to say to me fre- frequently, he said to me this all the time, 25 years ago, when all the experts agree, a thing is known. When they disagree, it is unknown. That was good advice for me. That was good advice for a young, up-and-coming manager at the time. In this case, the experts, in the case of our passage today, In this case, the experts disagree. And worse yet, their disagreements are tied to the intricacies of theological systems, some of which contain other presuppositions that are not agreed to in Scripture. So only someone very dogmatic would speak dogmatically on a passage like this as some arrogant seminary professors in the comfort of their offices like to do. In truth, aspects of this passage are unfathomable except by God's grace. From the heights, this is the great tribulation. The fall of the temple and Jerusalem in AD 70 is a foreshadowing of a greater tribulation that is to come an all-encompassing tribulation, a spiritual tribulation. Stay with me now. I know this is tough. I'll say it again. Okay, let me say that again. I don't want you to lose this. From the heights, this is the great, this passage, this is the great tribulation. The fall of the temple and Jerusalem in AD 70, thinking this way, is a foreshadowing of a greater tribulation that is to come. An all-encompassing tribulation, a spiritual tribulation, a tribulation to judgment and or for salvation. This view from the heights concords with other scriptures yet has difficulty, yet this interpretation has difficulty reconciling the definitive fall of the temple in AD 70, as well as verse 19, right? As well as verse 19, which says, for in those days there will be such tribulation as not, has not been and never will be. So that's on the one hand. On the other hand, That's the view from the heights, okay? Stay with me, metaphorically. That's the view from the heights. On the other hand, from the ground level, this tribulation seems specific to the fall of Jerusalem and the temple in AD 70. This feels unsatisfactory to some schools of end-time theology and even to our sense of history and the past, particularly in the sense that no true No time in history would be worse than this one, which has already passed. Now, how many of you think, um, this is going to sound weird. Don't, nobody, please don't take this personally. How many of you think Americans are soft? Anybody? I mean, some of the people, I mean, I I think if you come from a foreign country, 
you grew up in a foreign country. I didn't, but I think if you grew up in a foreign country, that might be, that might be something that kind of, a question that kind of makes sense to you in a different way, right? Now, not all Americans are soft, okay? I'm just saying many, some, right? And lacking discipline also, I'd say, but that's a different topic. Please let me remind you, because Americans today, by and large, have become quite timid, almost like, almost like somebody who's been in the house too long. And Americans today don't have a good sense of history or of pain. There has been much greater pain in the past than in American, than in a modern American history. And we get hung up on things that would seem quite minor to the ancients. For example, for example, when the Goths, Visigoths, and Vandals, ancient Germanic tribes, would siege a Roman city, they would pile the dead bodies, they would pile the dead carcasses along the city wall. So the stench would fill the walls of the city and terrify the inhabitants. Then, at the right moment, when they felt like the morale within the city walls was broken down enough, they would climb on top of the dead, rotting bodies to breach the city walls. You know, you've heard some of these, these terms. They're still around. Vandal, vandals, goss. They were ancient Germanic tribes. Nothing in our modern warfare matches this type of barbarism, even among the most cruel foreign soldiers. So the horrors and atrocities elucidated to in verses 17 through 20 in Jerusalem in AD 70 could have actually been worse than anything we've seen in the modern period or will see in the future. It's possible. But this is not, what I'm saying is not a theological argument, but only an accounting that Jesus' statement about tribulation pertaining to Jerusalem in AD 70 could be true. Nevertheless, I think it's best to see the tribulation in AD 70 as a, sign as a signification of a greater tribulation that is to come or else to understand that God has a much greater sense of time than we do. Why? Because of verses 24 through 27, we'll cover them next week, but because of verses 24 through 27, where we see the return of Christ. The great tribulation precedes the return of Christ. But in those days after that tribulation, says verse 24, they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory, says verse 26. Okay, so I hope that makes sense. That's, you've been given an affirmation on these verses with regard to the tribulation and what it is. Point four, discernment. Point four, discernment. Please read verses 21 through 24 with me. Do I only have 23 there? Give me, give me 24. I'm sorry, that was my mistake. But I'll read 21 through 23 first. And, and then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or look, there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect. Be on guard. I have told you all things beforehand. And just let me read you 24 also. Can you get it up or should I go to open, open to it? Let's see who's faster. Are they faster up there or me? They're probably faster because I don't see that good. Oh, they are faster, okay. But in those days after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. Seeing when these things happen takes discernment as Christ told his disciples beforehand. Don't be fooled by false messiahs. Um, you know what? Sometimes people do, I don't know, if, have you ever watched a sermon on TV? Who's watched a sermon on TV? Who watches sermons on TV all the time? Okay. 
Some of them are quite good. There are some preachers on TV that are quite good, that, 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 that are godly men and are faithfully sharing the message. But sometimes you'll watch a preacher on TV and um, clearly he's not preaching. <laughs> and clearly he's not preaching the word of God. So, 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 so you have to discern what the difference is. And the starting place is always the scripture. Is the scripture being preached or is the person just uh, off on his own someplace? So don't be fooled. Christ warns us that, that, that there will be false messiahs that rise up, false Christ. I mean, how scary is that? Are you watchful? Do you seek the truth? Are you on the lookout for the actual return of Christ, the actual return of Christ? This is what Christ instructs. He makes clear the return of Christ in our next verses. In fact, let's just read them anyway, okay? Go to, go to Mark 24, and we'll just read the next passage. You're going to cover it next week, but let's just read it, right? So you see in 22, Jesus says, False Christs and false prophets will arise and perform signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect. Are you saved? Are you the elect? If you're saved, you're the elect. You're being spoken to, right? You're being referenced. But watch, be on guard, but watch. I've told you about all of this ahead of time, right? But now watch what he says. But in those days, after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Ah, so this, this is clearly visible and this has to happen. If, 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 if a false Christ is stepping up, it's not, it's, it's not, you know, necessarily, it's not after this moment, right? If somebody today, this isn't happening right now, if somebody, right this moment, if somebody steps up right now and says he's the Christ, there's an issue, right? But in those days after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers in the heavens will be shaken and then, right? And here it is. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. Now, I'm not going to do anything more with this because I don't want to, I don't want to steal um, Aaron's thunder for next week. Okay. But Christ, but the return of Christ is made clear in our next verses. And that's clearly tied to our verses, and two, that the, tri the tribulation having occurred. In all of this, though, brothers and sisters, in all of this, we keep our hope and faith in Jesus Christ. In all of this, every single day, we remember that Jesus died for our sins and rose. That's why we don't fear. Jesus died for our sins and rose. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your love. Lord, you warned us. You say, I told you everything beforehand. You, you, you give us the picture so that we'll know the time. We'll know when it's time, when it's time to flee. We'll know when it's time to be careful. We know when it's time, when the end is coming, we'll know. We'll understand, we'll sense. We won't know the exact day. We can't predict it, but we'll, we'll, see, we'll see some things, right? So Lord, please, please, help, us, please help us to be faithful. Um, help us, if, if, somebody, if somebody stands up tomorrow and says, you know, the end of the world is, um, you know, in August, such and such day of 2022, that's, that's just not, that's not something we can go with. Only God knows. Only God knows the day, the hour. Lord, please help us to be faithful. Help us to be 
thoughtful and caring. Help us to keep our eyes on Christ and to be watching and looking for the return of Christ. We thank you for these things, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.